Hi, I'm Jay from Real Street Performance. Today we're gonna to talk about how I put bearings in an engine. Recently we posted a video and I was putting lubricant on the back side of the bearing to lubricate it as it goes down into its cradle and as it's located and some people um, just didn't sit well with them and they had questions. So we're just gonna kinda of walk through a step-by-step -step and talk about why I do it the way I do it, whether or not I'm right or wrong, whether or not I've had any bad outcomes from it and what I'm looking to avoid by doing it. To start off, I think there's a lot of folklore around a spun bearing. By the time you take an engine apart that the rod bearing has actually spun in the rod, the bearing has changed shape, it's much thinner, it's folded in on itself from being overheated, and it's clamped to the crankshaft and it allows it to turn in the rod. But by then, you've got a lot of completely destroyed parts. And the misconception that the bearing tab holds the bearing in place once the engine is assembled is incorrect because there are OEM engines that don't have bearing tabs at all. So you have engines that the bearing tab will face one direction, uh, engines the bearing tab will face another, some face all in the same direction on some V8 engines. Uh, if you have an engine that you have two rods on a common journal, then which way the rod faces is more critical on an inline engine. It's less critical, especially if you're using an aftermarket rod. We're gonna go into uh, what holds the bearing in place. Now, holding the bearing in place is not because of the tab. The tab is there to locate the bearing in the right position. If you don't have the bearing located correctly in the rod, then it could be too far over to the radius and you've got crankshafts that have long radius to make the crank stronger and the bearing will run into the radius, then you'll have a problem there. So the bearing tabs kind of locate the bearing in place for you to assemble the engine. But once you bolt the connecting rod together or bolt the main cap onto the block, the force when the bearing ends meet, that crush that forces it in place, that's why your housing has a minimum size and a maximum size because if the housing was too small, the bearing would crush and it would be deformed. And if the housing was too big, it's not gonna be able to transmit the heat that's generated on the surface of the bearing into the back of the bearing. It's not gonna be able to hold that bearing in place correctly. And then you could have a condition where you spin a bearing. What I do is I put a light oil like automatic transmission fluid on the back of the bearing and that way I can slide the bearing in place. Uh, we're gonna show you that there's some particulate that comes off off the back of the bearings and I'll go ahead and now clean those bearings, clean the back of the bearings. You never clean the front of the bearing. You never put anything abrasive on the face of the bearing because you could damage it. But as far as the back of the bearing, you can clean that up if it's got a little fuzz from coating because that will end up at the parting line of the rod. But more importantly, putting the oil there, for me, it allows that when those two surfaces meet and it's forcing that bearing in place, it's allowed to slide into its location and not have to worry about buckling or deforming the component during that process. This is my uh, Honda B20. I'm gonna put it in my little Civic hatch and we're using it as an illustration today to show you that when you bolt the cap to the block, it displaces that light fluid. Now, if you were using a thick fluid like assembly lube or a grease, then it's not gonna displace it. And the same rules would apply if you were using silicone. You know, there's silicones that you use that are displaced during assembly and, and silicones that have a thick bill that aren't displaced. So you wanna use a thin oil in this situation. And all you're doing is allowing some lubricant for the bearing shells to be located in their final place and a lubricant for any particulate to be displaced as you bolt the bearing down. And if you look close, there's some black, uh, looking stuff that's coming out with the trans fluid. And what that is, is that's some of the coating that's on the back of the bearing and it being flushed out of there, kind of hydraulic out of the way when those two pieces are bolted together is better than it being stuck behind the bearing back. Now, before I put these bearings in the final time, I'll use a uh, Scotch-Brite pad and I'll clean the back of the bearing off. I'm not trying to remove any material, but this particular bearing has a fantastic coating on the face but sometimes it's a little furry on the back because the coating gets on the back of the bearing. So you're just cleaning the back of the bearing, but you're not gonna use anything like sandpaper or anything like that. Just a little Scotch-Brite pad, a few minutes, just get it, get the, get the, the particulates on the back of the bearing off. That way when it lays in the shell, it's all gonna be as uniform as possible because you want the back of the bearing to be mounted as uniform as possible. So the front of the bearing because it's not uniform, it's kind of an oval shaped. 
can work correctly in the load point of the bearing as the crank is in rotation versus the reservoir sections of the bearing where the oil sits before being driven back into that hydrodynamic wedge that keeps the components from touching one another. Again, this is just how I do it, how I've been doing it. If you're using a non-coated bearing, the back of the bearing will generally be clean. It's just, you know, if you have experience and you have some touch, you can just feel the parts with your finger and make sure that there's nothing coarse or, or standing up off the back of the, the block uh, or the bearing back because you want all that stuff to meet in a nice uniform fashion because you can actually create um, deformation in the bearing and then it, it won't live very long. So you could um, possibly get away with not taking any of the steps that I do and have a fine outcome. It's just for me, in the years that I've been doing this, this the extra steps uh, that I take, I believe make a difference in the outcome. And I have a, what I consider a, a pretty good track record on success um, as far as putting engines together and not having them um, fail due to an assembly error. So maybe these steps aren't necessary, but it sure gives you a lot of time to familiarize yourself with the process and the parts. And the more familiar you are with what you're doing, the more comfortable you'll be, the less you'll question yourself, the more confidence you'll have, the more confidence you'll have, the more successful your engines will be. So it's like a low cost add on if you're doing this process yourself to just add a couple extra steps and make for a nicer engine.